I'm glad you announced that song because there's always at least somebody on the Lord's Day or on Wednesday I mess up their song list at some point. I change the number, I leave the number off or something, and so I'm glad he announced that. I'm always uh, making a mistake on someone's. But our lesson this evening comes from the book of Obadiah. And Obadiah is a book that you probably don't hear a whole lot about, but it's a problem that when you look at the book of Obadiah, one of the problems I find that stands out for us that we can learn from is the problem of pride. And we find as we go through this, we're going to find these individuals are not so different from what, what we see sometimes in people today, those who believe that uh, you know, there's nothing that's going to, to, to happen that's going to cause them to fall from their uh, pedestal, so to speak. Uh, but we find these individuals who were living in a life that was not including God were going to be punished for their actions. And so this evening I want to show what we can learn from the mistakes of Edom in the days of Obadiah. We begin by first looking at verses, and I've divided this up into two big chunks. The first being uh, the destruction of Edom is announced in verses 1 uh, through 16. And we have the announcement of judgment, then we also have the cause of judgment against Edom. And we begin in verses 1 through 9, being our first uh, division here, looking at the announcement of the judgment. And we have the announcement or the decree in verse 1 of Obadiah, which says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Now this is the announcement or the decree of judgment. They're going to rise up against Edom. And then next we find in the following verses the condition of, of Edom and some of the things that they were doing. And we also uh, we're going to see some uh, descriptions of their destruction and some of their allies and things like that. So we look next at verses 2 through 4 as we find the decree or the announcement of judgment here in verse 1. But in verses 2 through 4, we find the condition. And we find the condition is they are seed by pride, and they, are dis- and they are despised, and they are, no doubt, not looking to Jehovah any longer. In verses 2 through 4 of Obadiah, the Bible says, Behold, I'll make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. Now notice, the pride of your heart has deceived you. To me, that is key to understanding the book of Obadiah and the things that are happening here and why they're happening. It's because, primarily, at least in my opinion, pride. Pride, as we, as we find there also in the book of Proverbs, tells us pride goes before the fall, right? And so uh, we find the same idea here. The pride of your heart, he says, has, I notice, has deceived you. You who dwell in the class of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Do you remember back in the book of Daniel how the king during Daniel's time, Nebuchadnezzar, said similar things about, you know, who is this God? And he talks about how, you know, what, can, you know, what person can deliver you or what God can deliver you from my, from my hand and those types of things. And we find the same idea here, the same similar attitude, this pride. But here they say, their habitation is high, and they say, who will bring, bring me down to the ground? Who can bring destruction upon me? Who could possibly harm me in their habitation that's upon the high there in verse 3? In verse 4, notice how the Lord responds here. He says, though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. So the idea is no matter how high they get, and I don't think he's always talking about literal height here, but the idea that they are, their haughtiness and their elevation in their, maybe in their, uh, in their economy or their elevation among their people, no matter how high they get or high, how esteemed they become among the people, God can bring them down. We know also as we look at Matthew 24 and also there in the book of Revelation talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, how the stars will fall and different things like that, referencing the fall of those positions of power. And we find this same idea here in verse 3. These individuals are going to be brought down from upon high. He says in verse 4, And though you set your nest, or that is your home, among the stars, he says, from there I will, not, not a question, a possibility, but he says, I will bring you down, says the Lord. And so it's interesting that it is, again, God makes it very clear who's going to be bringing them down, who's going to reach up to where they are and pull them down. It is Him. 
So judgment is to be executed by Jehovah, and that's what's announced here in verses 1 through 4. It is the Lord who has announced judgment in verse 1. It is the Lord who's going to bring them down in verses 2 through 4. Next we find the, their destruction is described in verses 5 through 6. Looking at verse 5, the Bible says, If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Will they not have stolen till they had enough? If, gate, if grave gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some cleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be, shall be searched out, how, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. And we find this idea is their destruction of Edom is just going to be complete. It's going to be, there's going to be nothing left here. We find in verse 7, he goes on to talk about their allies. In verse 7, he says, All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Notice there that phrase there, the men at peace with you will be their allies. He says, they shall deceive you, that is, they're going to turn against you, and prevail against you, so they're going to overcome you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Meaning, those who, you're not, who you think are your allies, your friends, your brothers in arms, so to speak. He says they're going to turn against you. He says there in verse 7, no one is aware of it, meaning they don't seem to have a clue, but this is what's going to happen. He says they shall deceive you there in verse 7 and shall prevail against you. We look next at verses 8 and 9 of this section. We look at failure of, of wisdom and failure of might. In verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom? and understanding from the mountains of Esau. He says, Then your mighty men, O Timon, shall, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Meaning even those wise men are going to be what? They're going to be destroyed. He says, Understanding from the mountains of Esau, they're going to come to an end. Then your mighty men, he says, what? He says, They'll be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter, which means there's going to be no escape from them. Even the mighty man's going to be destroyed. Even the wise men are going to be destroyed. There will be no one left there who will possibly give any hope of coming out of judgment alive. Of course, it wouldn't matter if they were still there because God's judgment cannot be escaped once He has pronounced judgment against the people unless He decides to be merciful to them. In verses 10 through 14, we find the cause of judgment against Edom. In verses 10 through 14, we find that Edom is severely condemned for their cruel attitude shown toward their brother Jacob. He who stood with the enemies, whose aim what was to destroy God's people, they are turning against their own. Looking at verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. And you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, the idea here is that they're sitting by watching Jacob being carried off. He says, when you stood by, he says, on the other side, in, that, in the day that the strangers carried captive his forces, when, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them, saying, it's like as if you were one of them, helping them being carried away. They should have been helping, but instead they were part of the problem. Looking at verse 12 and following, he says, but you, shall not, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. They did they're sitting by watching, doing nothing. They should have been just gazing and watching and sitting by idly. He says, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. As if to say, you might, as if to say this won't happen to us. As we saw earlier back in verses 2 through 4. Verse 13 says, you should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Meaning the idea, as they're being carried away, as they're being abused, they're going in and they're doing what? Well, here, here go those brothers being taken away, and here comes Edom just going in right behind them, getting all their stuff. Instead of helping, they're just saying, well, they're being carried away. We're just going to go in and take all their stuff that's left behind. And we find here in verse 13, God is condemning them for that. He says, you notice how he uses the idea there in the day of their calamity repeatedly. In verse 13, the day of their calamity. In the day of their calamity, again in verse uh, 13, three times he uses that phrase. 
He says, you, sh- you should not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not gaze on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor lay a hand on their substance in the day of their calamity. Three times, and three times he's doing what? Showing how they were abusing their brethren, abusing Jacob here during their days of, as he says here, their day of their calamity. Looking at verse 14, he says, You should not have stood at a crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. And so we find in verse 14, it seems as if they were even helping Jacob being carried away. And he changes here and said, using the phrase, in the day of their calamity, he says, in the day of distress. You should not have delivered up those, he says, among, he should not have delivered up those among them who remained. Those who were going to escape, he says, you just delivered them up. God warned them repeatedly. We find in verses 15 and 16, judgment was going to come, and it's described here, uh, here in verses 15 and 16, it says, For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Now notice, in verses 14 and previous, we just saw what they're doing, abusing people and taking advantage of them in their day of calamity, in their day of distress. And God responds here in verse 15 saying, What's going to happen? The same thing to you. He says, As you have done, as you have done it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head, for as you drink on my holy mountain, as you drink on my holy mountain, so, sh- so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, it, and they shall be as though they had never been. What's going to happen? They're going to be punished for what they have done. Every sowing brings its own harvest, and Edom must now share in the judgment upon the nations, reaping the fruit of what they have sown. Next we find the exaltation of Israel in verses 17 uh, there through the end of the chapter. We find a remnant is mentioned in verse 17. We find that the kingdom of Jehovah is to be established upon Mount Zion. Looking at verse 17, he says here, But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. God's going to leave a remnant. Why? Because he's not, he doesn't desire to utterly destroy them. He wants them to be able to have, a, to have a remnant that's going to come back to him. A conquest, next we find in verses 18 through 20, a conquest of Edom, that is Mount Zir, and the surrounding nations in verses 18 through 20. The house of Jacob, he says, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain in the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountain of Esau, and the lowland shall possess Felicia. The, the, they, me, they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead. So we find here, though judgments pronounced against the nations, Edom will be a partaker, and the escape will be found only in Mount Zion. We also find that Israel, as we look at verse 21, will possess her enemies. That is, they're going to be given the ultimate victory. We look at verse 21 and 20 and 21 here. The Bible says, as we look at verse 20, And the captives of the host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zerah. The captives of Jerusalem who are in uh, Sarahed shall possess the cities of the south. What's going to happen? Israel again is going to be able to possess uh, their enemies. And we look at verse 21. Then Savior shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the king shall be the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So Jehovah's power is seen from Mount Zion. God's going to bring judgment upon Edom, and what's going to happen? They're going to be punished, while God's people are going to be restored, and are going to have the ultimate victory over those who have oppressed them. And we have seen this numerous times already throughout the minor prophets, where God's going to punish the wicked and the oppressed are going to be relieved and God's people are going to have, uh, have the victory. And those who have strayed, in, in some cases there is a remnant that is faithful that's going to be allowed to be, to be returned back to God. Now, if you think about some things which we can learn from this, we look at this very short book, we notice, first of all, that pride can lead to sin. Pride can lead to sin as you find it back in verses 3 and 4. 
Pride caused Edom to believe that nothing could harm them. We go back to verses 3 and 4. They said, what, you know, who can bring us down, right? Pride can cause Edom to believe that nothing could harm them. Pride is also found to be a problem for mankind from the very beginning. You go back to Genesis chapter 4 and looking at verse 9. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know, am I, am I my brother's keeper? There's a little bit of pride there, isn't there? He, he was, that was a pretty haughty uh, response, wasn't it? Am I my brother's keeper? A little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of arrogance. I don't know where Abel is. You know, that brother that, probably not that in Cain's eyes, that the Lord loved so much. But pride has been a problem from the very beginning. <clears throat> We go back and we look at Edom. We find the same thing. We look again at verses 3 and 4. The Bible says in verse 3, He says, You who dwell in the class of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Well, we know that, as I mentioned before, that we find there in Proverbs that haughtiness and, and pride goes before the fall. And we find the same idea here with Edom. Their arrogance definitely comes before their punishment. And God was going to punish them. We also find, as we think about some lessons for us today, not only that pride can lead us to sin, but also we find that brethren should help brethren. One of the things that Edom was being condemned for is they were sitting by watching as Jacob was carried away. They also took spoils while Jacob was carried away. They stood by and they did nothing to help them. And we find there, as we saw a moment ago in verses uh, 10 and following, that God was going to bring upon them the same treatment. They stood by and watched. We find in verse 17 that God uh, was, or excuse me, verse uh, 15 and 16, that God was going to bring judgment upon them, and they're going to have some of the same things come upon them as well, as we saw there in verses 10 uh, through 15, how they carried away things, how they even helped them, uh, seemed to help their enemies by preventing them from escaping, as we saw there in verses 14 and 15, or verses 13, 12 and 13, rather. But then verses 14 and 15, we find that God is going to bring a judgment upon them. Notice verse 14, how the wording here says, You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. You stood at the crossroads, meaning they were sitting by just waiting for them to come, and then they did what? They led them into captivity. And verse 15, what happens? The day of the Lord, he says, for the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. You know, that concept of you reap what you sow is seen so many times in, in scriptures. Old Testament, New Testament, we find it over and over again that man will no doubt pay for their actions. We find they even took their possessions, as we mentioned before, as they were carried away there in, verses, in verse 13. But as you think about Obadiah, and we think about some the things that have taken place here, we find pride and oppression of those who were close to them. You know, we've been talking, uh, well, we talked about this morning a little bit, then last Sunday morning as well, about doing good to others. As we talk about living on the Lord's side, well, we look at Edom, they were doing the exact opposite, weren't they? Instead of helping their, helping their brethren, they were just leading them off into captivity, helping them being led away. We must learn, as we think about these things this evening, we must learn to put our trust in God and not in ourselves. As we look back with Edom, at the very beginning of that chapter, what were they saying? Who can bring us down? No one can touch us, basically, right? We also find the very next verse, God tells them that I am the one who's going to bring you down. Though your nest is among the stars, they say, he says, I will bring you down from there to the ground. These people believed that they were untouchable. And that is a very dangerous thing to believe, that what could possibly happen to me, that I am in such a secure position, what could possibly happen to me? You know, despite all the things that took place this last year, year and a half, whatever, there's always things, it seems like, in the year, if you take any year, you can pick out moments where God has attempted to humble us. I say attempted because sometimes we don't pay enough attention to allow ourselves to be humbled by what takes place. You think back in March and April when things began to shut down, right? 
businesses closed, people had to go home, some worked from home, some could not, many became unemployed, many got sick, many came close to dying, many did die. Now think about Edom there in verse 3 and 4 when they say, who can bring us down? God has shown time and time again that if anyone can humble us, it's Him. Now I'm not going to say that what has happened over the last year is definitely by the providence of God that He has allowed these things to happen. But there are a lot of things that do take place in our lives that can cause us to wonder, is God trying to teach us a valuable lesson? We think about the transition of power and those types of things that have taken place in the last six months. And we think about the things we wish would happen, the things we hope would happen, things we need to happen, and then we think about the things that deserve to happen to us. You look at Edom, we find they were getting what they deserved, right? You go back and look at verses uh, 15 and 16 there, when God says you're going to bring upon them their own head what they have done, right? They were getting what they deserved. And we look here, we want to realize that when we think about our own lives and how we are living today, are we comparable to Edom? Do we have a pride problem? Are we willing and able to help out those who need help, to, to be able to assist our brethren? We find here in Obadiah's time, Edom was not. But they, in fact, mistreated their brethren. They, in fact, thought themselves to be untouchable, and God would prove them to, that they were wrong on both occasions, that they were wrong to be prideful and they were wrong to mistreat their own brethren. We also find that God will be merciful if we will turn to Him. What we find, however, though, is that Edom overwhelmingly, it seems, was not willing to turn. Because by definition, a remnant is a small amount, isn't it? A remnant is a small amount. When we say, well, someone asks you, is there any cake left? We say, well, there's a remnant left. I mean, that's a small piece of cake left, right? But when God is living a remnant, He's living a small group of people, meaning that the majority are going to face destruction, either destruction or being let off in some form of captivity. And then the remnant was going to be spared from those types of things. But we find that God will be merciful to them, but only to those who will come back to Him in obedience. You know, we have seen that theme throughout all these modern prophets we've been looking at, is that repentance is always the cure for whatever is going on. Those, in the, those who are involved in idolatry, repentance. Those who are involved in arrogance, like Edom, repentance. Those who are involved in mistreating their brethren, like Edom, repentance. And as we'll talk about next week as we get into the book of Jonah, what was, how do we fix Jonah's problem? Repentance. And probably a little bit of attitude change as well as we look at the final chapter of Jonah. But God will be merciful. But as we, as we get ready to close this evening... Now, we think about, at least I think about, Edom getting what they deserved. What would happen to us, and maybe we're getting a taste of it, maybe as individuals, maybe as a nation, what would happen if God decided that we're going to get exactly what we deserve? Now, to me, that's a very terrifying thought. Because we can look in the Bible... Specifically, we can look in the Old Testament. We can find what happens when nations get exactly what they deserve, right? When people get exactly what they deserve. During the time of Noah, when people got what they deserved, what happened? The rain came, right? The days of Sodom and Gomorrah, extreme wickedness, which to me, I, can, I think of Sodom and Gomorrah, I can help but think about us and some other nations as well. And when they got what they deserved, what happened? Well, fire came from the sky, right? And we think about those who pursued God's people during the Exodus, crossing the Red Sea, what happened to Pharaoh's army? They got what they deserved, right? The water came back upon them. But we think about what we deserve and then compare it to what God gives us. He gives us second chances while on this earth. He gives us third chances. He gives us more chances that we deserve to be able to come back to Him. You know, even for Edom, as they were being pronounced, judgment was being pronounced upon them, until the judgment began to be poured out, there was a chance of hope. You go back to Amos, what happened? We find that God showed mercy numerous times to those in the time period of Amos because repentance was going to take place, at least for a remnant. 
And so we think about Edom, we think about those things that happened during Obadiah's time. We find that Obadiah, or excuse me, not Obadiah, but Edom rather was receiving what they deserved. What can we do today to avoid receiving what we deserve? We can avoid it by repentance. We can avoid it by turning back to God. So whether we're talking about a nation as a whole, we're talking about ourselves as individuals. In order to prevent receiving the judgment of God in some way, perhaps in this life, if not in this life, then definitely in the judgment scene, how do we avoid that? By coming back to God as humble servants. This morning, or this evening, rather, as you think about these things, you think about what we've seen in Edom, let's be those who are mindful that we make sure we do all we can, that we don't find the same traits that we find in Edom, that we don't find those same traits in us as well. This evening, we can help you or assist you in any way and come forward now. That's good. We stand and sing the song that's been selected. There's a land that is fairer than day.